So chronic vestigial leukaemia is in fact the commonest leukaemia in the UK. It tends to be a disease of the more elderly of life, therefore it's not had a lot of publicity that other uh, types of cancer and leukaemias have had over the years. It's often found by chance, two thirds of patients are found by chance. Being a disease of the elderly, other bits of us fail, prostate gives trouble, joints give trouble, gallbladder gives trouble, a routine blood count will often detect something wrong with the blood, most notably an increased lymphocyte count, and that usually kicks off the whole process of what is wrong with the blood. So if you take those patients who are found by chance, that's roughly two thirds of all patients with CLL. Uh, if you follow these patients up over time, some patients will actually progress from their disease. They'll develop symptoms from it, sweats, uh, weight loss, fevers, uh, lymph node enlargement, living spleen, enlargement, abdominal discomfort, where a third of, of patients, actually nothing has happened to within the 10 years. What you don't know at diagnosis with that 70% of patients who are found by chance is often which group those patients are in. Are they in the group where nothing is likely to happen during their normal life expectancy or are they in the group where the disease is likely to change, affect their health and require treatment? Basically, if, if you go back 20 years, we had a lot of patients who were found by chance with lymphocytosis. As clinicians, we didn't necessarily tell them that they had chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. In a lot of these groups, especially the elderly, your presumption was that maybe nothing would happen to them and therefore you'd avoid using the term leukaemia with these patients. Over time, we realised that really wasn't the way one should be managing these patients and therefore it's now the common thing to advise patients that they have chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. The problem with the words chronic lymphocytic leukaemia, the word that actually strikes the patient and they all hear is the word leukaemia. It is not the word chronic. Whereas actually the most important word of the three is the word chronic. Because it means that nothing needs doing imminently, uh, but we obviously do, from the patient's perspective, need to try and ascertain better what will happen to the patient. Over the last 15 years or so, there's been innumerable prognostic markers identified to try and inform individual patients what will actually happen to them in their disease. Do they have something they can almost forget about because it will never affect their health? Or do they have something which they should be wary of and should be on the lookout for symptoms and signs because it will affect their health? And although we have many prognostic markers available to us now, unfortunately, they tell you what will happen to the herd. How many of the cattle will fall down with a certain illness, for example? What it doesn't do is tell you about the individual. And therefore, the individual level knowing what will happen to the herd isn't necessarily of value to them and therefore often the default position is actually to watch and worry. We use the term watch and wait, we actively see patients in my department, we examine them regularly, we talk to them regularly. I think you know, it's almost uh, you know, talk in therapy. Patients want the opportunity to ask, they want to hear what their clinicians say, they want to know what's happened in the last two years or so. Uh, with the knowledge available. Other centres adopt the approach that having been diagnosed, if you look like watch and wait, discharge you back to the GP. And I think there needs to be a discussion whether that's the right thing for the patient uh, or whether therapy by simply meeting the physician is of value or not. You see a mixed picture with patients. Some patients actually value the appointment. They want to come along, hear what's happening. Is there anything new? Has the landscape changed? Other patients actually, the week or two before they come and visit you, worry enormously. What are they going to say to me? What will the blood count show? And therefore, I think you have to picture what does the patient actually want uh, from this approach. Uh, and it's very difficult. You've only met the patients once or twice. Uh, a, for them to know what they actually want. Some of them want to be told there's nothing to worry about, go away. But we haven't really got the tools in the toolbox to be able to say that definitively. Other patients actually would prefer to try and forget about it and it's very interesting the family dynamic sometimes the patient wants to forget about it and the, and the partner doesn't uh, and therefore when they come to clinic part of the time you're talking to the partner not necessarily to the patient. It's very different with different patients and their partners 
And if you only see them once or twice, it's difficult to ascertain what sort of patient you have in front of you and of, often what the patient really wants from the consultations once you've decided that immediate treatment is not required. So ironically, one of the things, if you are one of those patients who present need in treatment, some patients actually see that as a good thing. Uh, it's of course not a good thing to actually require treatment. It means your disease is more advanced, it means it's affecting your health. And of course, all treatments at the moment have potential side effects, albeit the treatments we have available to us now are really very, very good. For those patients on the watch and wait, it is actually, in lots of ways, a more psychologically difficult thing to live with. It's one thing to have symptom and signs. You have a treatment, those symptoms and signs go away. You know you're better than you were before. For those who are watching weight, the unknown is a very difficult thing. And for the patients on active monitoring, it's partly an educational thing for the patient, but it's also, as I say, the opportunity for the patient to see for themselves that their disease is not changing. And if there is parameters we can look at in consultation with the patient to actually reassure the patient that at this moment in time all is still looking good. So it's an area of unmet clinical need. A lot of clinical development is pushed forward by those patients requiring treatments, uh, those loved ones of patients requiring treatment, or dare I say even the pharma industry are pushing forward the new treatments. For the watch and wait group there isn't really any funding body pushing forward uh, therapies or approaches for that and therefore it's very very timely that Leukaemia Care along with its sister charities are pushing forward and highlighting the importance of watch and wait and the importance of actually managing that in the most appropriate way. It's the biggest group of CLL patients at the end of the day but resource wise it's not attracted a lot of resource in the past and that's why it's great that Leukaemia Care are taking this on.